Thank you, everybody. So happy to be here with you all tonight. Um, I just want to share something. The last couple of weeks, I kept going over a word that I actually preached about 10 or 15 years ago. It was a super long time ago. And um, I kept remembering it this week. I went back into my notes to have a little look. And um, it was about the fact that God gave me a dream one night. And in the dream, he asked me, would I be his echo? And so that was the whole gist of the whole thing that I preached about being the, the echo of God. And so I was thinking about that uh, and praying about it the last week or two. And you know, echo is an exact replica of a sound, isn't it? Um, it's, it's the exact replica. I mean, it's exactly the same as the original. And I know that we're in a, a world right now where people are saying, don't be an echo, be yourself. But I really feel that God spoke to me very clearly about being an exact replica of his voice. And in order to like replicate a sound, you have to really, really listen. And we are not in a, a place in the world right now where anybody's listening to anybody. <laughs> and, so, and so in order to like really hear the voice of the Lord, you really have to shut all the other voices out. And whenever I talk about listening to the Lord, um, I think about uh, a time when um, I was in a conference years ago, and, I, and this was a long time ago, and I was on the worship team, and I was one of the singers there, and there were a big bunch of us, and uh, this guy was trying to teach us a song really, really fast, and he said, we've got 20 minutes to the meeting, so just listen to me, listen, and he started to sing the song, and the minute he was like two bars in, right, two bars in, and all the singers start going, and they all start humming so he goes shh stop singing listen and then he sings again and it was just a disaster because the singers couldn't help themselves but sing because they're singers <laughs> and if you know anything about music um, within the first couple of bars you, you can catch the key and you can, you can pick a note anywhere in that key and it usually will harmonise with the melody, which is why people who know music or who are singers can sing along to a song they've never heard before. They can hum along to it because they can anticipate where it's going next. And that's what was happening. And he kept trying to shut us, uh, shut us all down. And he kept going, stop singing, be quiet. And so it would get quieter until in the end he was like, it's like this tiny little humming. People couldn't help themselves. The point he was trying to make was this. I know you can find a harmony note here, but what I don't want tonight is a bunch of harmonies because if we get a bunch of harmonies on the stage, no one can hear the melody. We need a melody. And right now in society, we need the strong melody of the Lord. We need that tune. Right, which means we have to listen because sometimes we can think we are in tune with the Lord and catch a harmonic note when in fact we are actually singing out of key, but we are telling ourselves we sound awesome. And so in order to really listen to God, you really do have to turn off your own opinion, your own thoughts. And we've talked a lot this year about humility, being in a place of humility and really listening to the voice of the Lord. And so while I was just contemplating this and thinking about it, um, I just felt God speak to me about a scripture actually from Jeremiah 31, which I'll read in a minute. And I thought, when we are listening to the voice of God, right, he's not a dictator or a taskmaster. We always have choice. Well, people say we have choice, but do we really? Because he said in the Old Testament, I set before you life and death, choose life. So you've got a choice, but use your choice, choose life. And so we all have a choice and he's telling us what to choose. And so when we are walking with him and in a place of just like, loving him, serving him. It's, it's not from a dictator, taskmaster point of view. His point of view is from relationship and from really, really loving us. And I just want to come to this place a minute. While we're talking about being an authentic echo of the voice of, law, of the Lord, 
I want to make sure we understand this from a place of relationship and not from a task or something that we feel we have to do, but it's from a place of relationship. And, you know, when you sometimes are praying or sitting with the Lord, you're worshipping him, you can pour your heart out to the Lord. You can tell him everything about everything that's going on. Um, one of the things I said to the Lord years ago was, please let me have the right to be wrong in your presence because if I feel I can be wrong it means I can pour out everything and then I will take your correction and repent from the wrongness and do the right thing but that's what relationship is you see and God is not condemning he's not a condemning God he's a convicting God but he's not a condemning God and so when we are in that place of relationship he becomes like a good father to us like a best friend a good clever shepherd he's all of those things to us and so we're in this place of love with him and in this scripture I want to read to you in Jeremiah 31 verse 3 it says the Lord appeared to us in the past saying I have loved you with an everlasting love I have drawn you with loving kindness so three times there you've got this word love represented I have loved you with an everlasting love, I have drawn you with loving kindness. But those three words in the Hebrew are completely different words. And so the first word there, I have loved you, implies an ardent and vehement inclination of the mind and a tenderness of affection at the same time. It describes the close attachment between parents and children. Also a desire to possess or be in the presence of the object of love. And it describes the unspeakable love and tender mercies of God in the covenant relationship he has with his people. So all of you parents right now, when you think about your children, you know you will do anything for your kids. You want them to succeed. You want them to prosper. And even if you've got little children right now, you know that you have plans in your heart for your children, that you are hoping they will marry well, that they'll have a good job, they'll have enough money, they'll be able to go on vacation, they'll have kids themselves, they'll always be healthy, they'll always be happy. And so that's just an indication of how God feels towards us. It's, it's an affection towards us and a close attachment, but also a desire to be in the presence of the object of love. And I feel if ever we've understood that, it's this year, because some of us have not seen people in our lives for a long time. I was trying to remember actually this week, when was the last time I saw my father? And it was sometime way back in 2019. I can't even quite pin it down, but it's a long time. And so when you're not in the presence of the people you love, you feel it. And so God wants us in his presence. He wants us with him he likes this close affection and this close association he likes hanging out with us he likes being with us many times I've come into church meetings especially prayer meetings and as I come through the door I always get this sense that the Lord has been up since early waiting for us can't wait for us to get in the room looking at us all like are they going to clap their hands are they going to pray out loud like are they going to worship me from their heart what have you got for me today guys I always feel he's anticipating when we come together as the gathered church he's anticipating who we are going to be and how we are going to turn up because he loves us so so much. Then the next time love is mentioned in Jeremiah, so that was the first one, I have loved you. Then the next one with an everlasting love. And that word really means my beloved, my beloved. And that is the word that's used in the Song of Solomon's a lot. And you know that that book is a complete and utter love story. And then the last time love is used, I've drawn you with loving kindness. That word is one of the most important words in the Old Testament is hesed. And hesed denotes an act of kindness, love or mercy. The quality of the kindness shown is usually reserved for close friends and family members. And it made me think of that uh, saying, blood is thicker than water. 
And whenever I think about the difference between close friends and family members and other people, it often brings me to this time when I was in a supermarket and this guy just walks up to me randomly with a picture frame in his hand and he says, I really want to buy this for my mother and I'm $20 short. Can you give me $20? And I looked at him and I thought, you could be a scam artist. You could be, you know, laying her on thick. Mm, I don't know. And as I'm contemplating it, thinking, thinking, in the end, I thought, I'll just take the money. I just gave him the $20. I don't know what he did with it. He just disappeared. But anyway, um, but I thought in that moment, if that had been a family member, if that had been my son, I said, Mom, I'm short of $20. Here you go, son. Here you go. Because we've got a relationship. If it had been a close friend, if it had been like one of the leaders in the church or, or some of the guys in the church that I, I know, I know them, and they turned up in my and they're like, Angela, can you help me? I'm short of $20. There would have been no questions asked. You didn't have to pay me back. Just take it. Use the $20. And so the, the relationship means something. And what Hesed is saying is the quality of kindness that is shown is reserved for close friends and family members. And that's us in God's eyes. We are his close friends and his family members. So when I was thinking about blood is thicker than water, um, that whole expression just means basically that your kin are more important to you um, than even loyal friends and acquaintances like blood. The DNA, the bloodline is thicker than water. You'll always stand by your family and stand up for your family and even go against close friends. If, if your family is in jeopardy in any way, you'll always stand by your family first. That's what that expression means. But in the New Testament, it's the blood of Jesus that's brought us in as kin, which means I'm going to stand by you because you belong to me now and I belong to you because we are in the family that God has created. And it's the blood of Jesus that's made us thicker than water. It's the blood of Jesus that's pulled us in. And so therefore, as God's kids, we should be more loyal, more honouring, more lover loving, more gracious, more forgiving. Now, all of these awesome things, that should be us no matter what we stick together until 2020. Because <laughs> then it all started to go downhill. And it has been quite a shocking year for us, um, for many of us. Many of us have gone through personal stuff, personal hardships. I've got to be honest with you, I've talked to many people who have found this past year to be a blessing. And um, they've had wonderful things happen this past year. And they've got amazing testimonies to share about the goodness of God. But for a lot of people, it's been very, very trying. And so I just want to address this a minute. Now, remember, this is in the backdrop of being an authentic echo for God. And that comes from a place of relationship uh, where we are deeply, deeply loved. But on December the 13th, it was just a few weeks ago in 2020, December the 13th. I was sitting at home um, with one of my daughter-in-loves and she asked me a question. And she said, what's God saying to the church for 2021? And I fobbed her off with that. I'll pray about that. But what actually happened was God spoke to me straight away into my heart and I knew I needed a minute to process it because he said to me, before you get the word for 2021, you better get the word for 2020. So I was like, but it's December the 13th. You know, we, we're right at the end. We've got like two weeks left. But God spoke to me really clearly. What's the word for 2020? Because you see, sometimes context, well, not sometimes, always, we need context. We need to know where have we been? Where are we? Where are we going? And so I said to the Lord, well, what is the word then for 2020? And God said to me, distinction. But not distinction as in, here's a good grade. <laughs> distinction as in, a difference or a contrast between similar things or people. Where all of a sudden things become distinctive. And so the people that you are standing next to, the people around you, suddenly distinction comes into place and things are starting to be seen clearly. Another meaning for that is set apart often by excellence. 
And so when I think back to the beginning of 2020, and um, we had a lot of people uh, out on social media, uh, prophets and church leaders saying 2020 is the year of clarity, it's the year of clear vision. I actually think they were right because clarity has come this past year for a lot of us. Who's in and who's out for a start? <laughs> who's with the Lord? Who is not? Who loves him, uh, worships him, puts him above all else? I know there's that song that we sing in um, and it says, I exalt thee, there will be no one besides you. You know, and those, some of those old songs that we sing, like we are saying, God, you're there, you're up there. Nothing else is coming in front of you. But this year, I feel for some people, and some of those people have stood next to me in church singing these songs, but I feel like as if so much stuff has come that the relationship has got tested between them and the Lord. The whole thing I read from Jeremiah, there's been a testing on that hesed. And then all of a sudden, this that they believe in the Lord starts to like almost go like the sunset and disappear out of their sky. And all of a sudden, here are, you know, issues. These issues are the most important issues. This is what I'm living for. This is what I'm campaigning for. And I feel like as if any time that happens, anything that replaces the Lord, it doesn't mean you can't have a cause and can't believe in things. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. But any time it replaces the Lord, becomes more important th than the Lord, is your focus, you have to bring him back up into the center of your sky. He has to be there. And so this thing about um, clarity for me this past year has been incredible. And I just want to take a minute because I feel as we are closing out 2020, I just feel that um, an awful lot of people have really had to battle with discouragement, especially a lot of leaders. And um, Kerry Newhoff put out uh, a statistic just recently and he said, he asked a question and he said, how many of you have had an increase in your critics this year than you normally would? And 76% said yes. And a lot of those people were people who lead churches. And so in a year where we should be really hunkering down and supporting each other, what's actually happened is because of stress, and I believe lack of relationship with the Lord, people have started to turn on each other and actually kind of turn on the church a little bit. And I want to explain that for a minute. Um, when I, uh, when I, my kids were little, I went to have like a play date with a friend of mine and she had children a similar age. And she had a little girl who at the time was maybe about eight years old. She was the sweetest little girl. She had such a sweet disposition. She was patient. She was kind. She was honouring to her parents. She obeyed everything they said. She was lovely. And one day while I was sitting there in the house and we were drinking coffee together, this little girl comes running in from the backyard, runs through the kitchen door, through the dining room, through the living room and aims for the staircase to run upstairs. And her mother says, hey, hey, what's going on? And I can't even remember what she said, but she was very rude to her mother. And um, she ran upstairs, shouted something at her mother and disappeared. And her mother looked at me and said, that's not like her at all. Give me a minute. So she went upstairs and spoke to her daughter. What was happening was the little girl was getting bullied in school and the family didn't know anything about it, and she wasn't telling anybody, but her place of refuge was her home. And so she would play outside in the backyard with a brother and a sister, and they would have lots of fun. And lo and behold, this guy that's bullying her in school moves in next door. And this day she realises that the bully's next door and she cannot cope anymore, runs in and is rude to her mother because of the stress. I just want to encourage all church leaders out there, or people that are, are gatherers and people that care for people, if you are having any kind of backlash this year of people, it's because of the stress that they are going through that they don't know how to handle and they're lobbing it at you because church is an easy target. Leadership is an easy target. We had um, a good friend of ours once, we asked him, did he want to come into senior leadership? And his answer was, why on earth would I put a target on my back and say, shoot me? <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes you're just in that place where people are just pitchforking all their agony and throwing it at you. Don't take it personally. 
Just let the Lord love them. Just, just pray for them. Ask God to intervene in their lives. People are hurting and they don't know what to do with the hurt. And so I just want to say to all of you people, if you've had a really discouraging year this year, hang in there. Just hang in there. I want to read to you really quick a couple of scriptures. Um, the first one is 2 Chronicles 15, 7. Now as for you, be strong and never be discouraged because there will be reward for your work. Proverbs eleven eighteen. But he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. Ruth 2, 12. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. We always want to be under the wings of the Lord seeking refuge. Hebrews 10 verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. And so for all of us, we don't want to be throwing away our confidence. We don't want to be in a place where we are so discouraged. We just throw in the towel in. I'm just saying to you, if you've had the, the worst year of your life this year, hang in there and let God turn it around for you for this year, because this past year has been a, a year where God has just really caused distinction to come, where all of us are starting to be very clear about what we think, what we believe, who we are following. And so don't throw your confidence away because God is promising us that our work will be rewarded Everything that we do, we do from an eternal perspective. That is the main distinction, actually, between us and the world, is we, we have an understanding of eternity. We have an understanding that one day we will stand before God and give an account for our lives. Therefore, how we live on this earth is important in God's eyes more than anybody else. There's a great scripture in Proverbs 29 that says this, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And sometimes those two halves of that scripture feel like as if you've put them on a weighing scale. You've got fear of man on the one side and you've got trusting in the Lord in the other. And it's really difficult if you really have a tendency to be a people pleaser um, you don't want to upset people. You don't want to hurt people. That fear of man sometimes will creep in there. Or if you're trying to build something and you want it to be successful and you want to attract all these different kinds of people, that fear of man can sneak in there. And so you have to come to this side and say, I'm going to trust in the Lord and I, I will be kept safe. That's his promise to me. I will trust in the Lord more than anything else. I just want to finish really by um, reading a scripture from Matthew 7. It's a parable and it's the wise and foolish builders. And it says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, be an echo, right? Everyone who hears these words of mine, stop singing, start listening. What is God saying? And puts them into practice. And that's the other side of the coin. Don't just be a listener, but be a doer. Is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it felt with a great, it fell, sorry, with a great crash. And so we have to know that by being born again and fully serving the Lord, we have built our lives on the rock that is Jesus Christ. We are firm, we are secure and we have built on the rock. And so all of this I'm saying to you tonight is because I went back to the Lord and said, so what is the word then for 2021? And God said to me, deeper distinction. <laughs> so everything that's happened this year, I feel is almost a precursor for this coming year where God is able to almost like 
put his hands through his body, put his hands through the church, put his hands through the earth, through the world, through all people everywhere, and, and ask himself, where do you stand before me? Where do you stand before me? Where do you stand before me? And this coming year, a deeper distinction is going to come. And I honestly believe that God has called us to be the light in the world, to be the salt of the earth. But we've got to know we are built on the rock. We listen closely to his voice. And we're not an echo of society. We're not an echo of anything going around us. We're an echo of Jesus Christ and his words because he is the life. Don't throw away your confidence. You will be greatly rewarded. And just as I'm closing out here, I just want to say a couple of things. Just as I was praying today, I want to pray, I want to say to all of you prayer warriors and intercessors, some of you are hiding, some of you got lazy, some of you are scared of the call, you're up. It's your season, it's your time. Prayer warriors and intercessors, you need to come out to the trenches. You need to start crawling across no man's land and taking ground. I also felt the Lord say this to me. There's a bunch of people in his church across the earth who he calls the quiet ones. They don't say too much, but they've got a lot of depth in them. They do have something to say, but they never push themselves forward. It's time for the quiet ones to arise. It's time for the quiet ones to start speaking out, start speaking up, start imparting truth to people and encouragement to people. It's a season for the quiet ones. And I also felt God speak to me, and this is the last one, about re-sparking the flame. He didn't say reignite, re-spark the flame. And I think for some people, you may have coasted along year by year. God's been good to you. You love the Lord. But the flames gone low and the way you re-spark a flame or spark a flame two ways one is friction which is necessarily a bad thing it just means movement one is friction and one is through a magnifying glass and I just want you to know if you have felt friction in your life or if you felt God's magnifying glasses on you it's because he's trying to spark the flame there's a flame in you that's supposed to be rising brighter brighter, brighter. So Father, I just say yes and amen to everything, God, that you have spoken to us tonight. I just pray your peace on this word. I just pray, Father, that you would continue to speak to our hearts through this week. You'll continue to speak to us about deeper distinction, that we are able to clarify ourselves what that means. What does that mean to me? How am I distinctive? What is God doing in my life? What do I believe? And Father, I just pray for this coming year, wherever there is disunity, you will bring unity. God, wherever there's discouragement, you will bring courage and encouragement. Father, we just say thank you for being an awesome God. We love you, Lord. Amen.